A few minutes ago, I heard of the passing of Rav Aaron Lichtenstein, who was my first uh, Rebbe. When I came back from Israel in 1968, I entered his, his year. Actually, I came back from Israel to enter his year. I had been in Israel for two years, and I wrote my parents a letter saying I wanted to continue to study in the yeshiva in Israel, and they were not unhappy with that. And they said, if you come back, we'll arrange that you'll be in the shir <coughs> of Rabbi Lichtenstein. So, <coughs> that was one of the major, major inducements to, to bring me back. I came to a shir in 1968, and it was a transformative experience. Now, today is the 16th day of the Omer, and each day of the 49 days of the Omer in Kabbalistic thinking has its own particular identity. Today is Gevura Sheba Tiferet. Gevura is strength, Tiferet is majesty. The quality of, of Gevura is one that's associated in that tradition, Kabbalistic tradition, the Hasidic tradition, with Yitzchak. Yitzchak is the one who digs wells. He never leaves the land. He stays, one might say, within his own four cubits. He, he works on himself. He works to improve. And in fact, the very wells that he digs initially are not even his own wells. He digs up the wells of his father Abraham, the ones Abraham had dug. And the Torah says he, he names them with the same names that Abraham had named them. And thinking about Rabbi Lichtenstein, the first quality that comes to mind is the quality of Gevura. That is to say, the quality of, of labor, the quality of hard work, of digging deeper. In fact, when I first came to the yeshiva, people would say that his class was the class you took before you went to Rabbi Salavatia's class as a preparation. And that was only really a small part of the truth because he was very much his own person. This idea of working hard, he would walk into the class the year carrying many books, and even before he put books down on the table, he would begin to talk. He never missed a class in my two years in Shia, not once. And he was unhappy if anybody missed classes. And remember that in the first year in June, officially there was no more class, but he gave extra classes. And he was told that some of the boys didn't come. That one day they went to the beach. I remember him commenting in the class. He said, the Torah says that, the Torah is not beyond the, the, uh, the rivers. And then he added, and it's not on the side of the river either, referring to the beach. He had a sense of humor. But I want to get back to this quality of Gevura. The idea of Gevura, the idea of restraint, the idea of hard work. His method in teaching Torah, he taught Gemara. He was within what is known as the Brisker method of teaching, the idea of taking the particulars and conceptualizing them. He was in particular a master at collecting, collecting from all parts of the Talmud, parts of Shas, a particular concept gathering them together, and then he would find, he would make distinctions between the concepts, what appears to be similar. Seven different situations, for example, where the halacha speaks of cooking, he would then go through each one and distinguish. One might say he would give each one each, one its own place. The Brisker method in general, as opposed to the method of Pilpul, the method of Pilpul was to find the commonalities of things and to build upon them. The method of risk was to find the commonality of things and to distinguish between them. One might say to find a place for each particular thing, to give each thing its own integrity, to recognize the integrity of each thing. And I would say this approach to the study of Gemara extended beyond just in terms of clarification and analysis, but extended to trying to understand 
the, the reason behind different opinions. One of the early memories I have of this class was that we were studying Tractate Kedushin, first Amud of Kedushin, Tosfot discusses the question. The Mishnah says that a woman is acquired by giving money and, and or shavakasif, that which is worth money. Tosfot asks the question, how do you know that an object that's worth money qualifies as money? And Tosfot had two opinions. One is logically, why not? And the other is Tosfot searches for a source. Now, I remember Rabbi Lichstein saying, what are they really arguing about? What are they, what's the rationale behind each opinion? The idea that we have the obligation to explain, to understand the other opinion extended way beyond just the daf of Gemara. It was an approach in life. Things are more complicated than they first appear. Things are nuanced. Don't be so sure that you have the whole truth. Hear the other side. That was very central, not just to his view of studying Talmud, but to his view of life. Eilu va'eilu. There's more than one reason. There's more than one valid opinion. There's more than one truth. That extended beyond. And in that sense, I think we move from Gvura to Tiferet. Gvura being the sense of digging deeper to understand, working very hard. Tiferet, majesty, is something very different. That's a quality that the Kabbalists identify with Jacob. Jacob also was alone, but Jacob has to leave his place. Jacob struggles, but he wrestles with, with uh, angels. But Jacob is different. The idea that the human being can wrestle with God attests to the dignity and majesty of the human being. Rabbi Lichtenstein was keenly aware of both, of human limitation, of human myopia, of human intolerance. At the same time, he recognized human possibility. And he saw his role as a teacher in conveying to his students those values and the possibility of, of growth. And even though, strange to say, the study of Torah was paramount in his life, in his work, but ultimately the study of Torah for him was actually part of something much bigger, which is the obligation of every person to, he would say, to be God's servant, to, to do God's work in this world. For him, for a Jew, the study of Torah was a part of that, but it did not necessarily exhaust itself in that. And as part of this dedication, not just to the study of Torah, but to human dignity, he placed a particular emphasis on elements of Torah which dealt with what we would call Be'odem HaChavero, human responsibility, the way you treat the other. He talked and wrote about concepts such as Kofino to Amidat Sedom, the concept of Ufni Mishurat Adin, to go beyond the law. We took the position that going beyond the ethical responsibility is also an ethical responsibility. This was, in his view, his obligation as a as a, as a teacher. And I would say that his deep interest in, in Israel, and of course he made Aliyah just shortly after I was in his uh, class in, in the States, he went to Israel, he went to the Gush, where he parted with Rav Amital, that was also a model in two people working together and respecting each other. But he very much believed in, in, in the possibility of the land of Israel as a way to fulfill, he would put it, the work we have to do, serving God, and together with the opportunity that he saw to serve God in Israel, and together with the opportunity that the State of Israel gives to provide the Jews, and especially after the Shoah, a sense of dignity, but for him, human dignity went hand in hand with human responsibility. I remember one of his favorite passages in the Talmud where the Gemara in Tractate Brachot speaks about workers, and the Gemara says that a worker is exempt from the fourth blessing of the grace after meals, Mazon. 
because the worker shouldn't take time off to say the fourth blessing, which is only rabbinic. The fourth blessing takes about 15 seconds to say, but the worker has a responsibility to do his work. That was one of his favorite, and I think a very telling uh, passage from the Talmud in the way he saw obligation. So together with opportunity and possibility comes a, a deep sense of responsibility, which he not just talked about, but he actually walked the walk. He, that's the way he behaved. I want to say one last bit about Rabbi Arnold Lichtenstein that may not be known to some people. I've had several very good teachers in my life, and I've been blessed to have some excellent teachers. Rabbi Lichtenstein was a, was a great teacher. Not just a good teacher, but a great teacher. He had unbelievable patience. He saw his responsibility to the student as helping you think better, and he also saw his responsibility as trying to develop a, a religious personality, trying to grow the person, which is why each of the semesters that he taught, he would take out time to teach something besides Kamara, whether it was prayer, separate section on prayer, whether it was Judaism and uh, humanism. He felt that part of his responsibility in terms of growing the students of course, primarily it was about the study of Torah, but he tried to connect us to something broader. And he was, would often bring in other sources, non-Jewish sources, non-Jewish thinkers, to uh, support his arguments, sometimes to distinguish between a Jewish point of view and a non-Jewish point of view. But he had the ability of embracing X without diminishing Y. And he would often bring this into his teaching. But the ultimate goal was to broaden us as human beings and to get us to be thinkers and to engage us much more deeply in the study of Torah. Ultimately, not just to study Torah, but to love the study of Torah. Rabbi Salavechik, he represented for us the love of Torah that's best expressed in the Song of Songs. Place me as a seal upon your heart, the love is like the flames, the flames of God. Rabbi Luchasim was different. He also expressed the love of Torah, but in a different way. His was not the love of the fire. His was the love of the deep and still waters. And Ultimately, that's how he saw his role. His role was not just to come into a class and to impart knowledge. His role was to give us the tools which we would take with us throughout our lives, to be students of Torah, to take responsibility for the Torah, and to be passionate lovers of Torah. He was an important teacher in my life, one of my great teachers, but his teachings live on, continue to live, and to challenge us as we move forward to love Torah and to take responsibility for Torah, for ourselves, and for our various communities. His memory is a blessing.